talking about finding that treasure in the field and selling everything you have to buy it. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. And I'm truly having coffee with you this morning. Susan's working on some furniture. We try to stretch the dollars. She likes doing it, to be quite honest. But we found found some furniture really at a really good price. And it needed some work. So she's been spending a couple of days uh, working on the furniture. And I'm doing the podcast. You know what's cool is I just got in from mowing the lawn. And why is that so cool? Because right as I was mowing the lawn and I finished, it started sprinkling and now it's like a full on rain. <laughs> Thank you, God. By the time you hear this podcast, I think we'll have a couple of ministry opportunities actually underneath our belt. Um, we're, we're still praying through what the will of the Lord is for this Gulf Coast region. And as I'm praying it through, I'm pretty certain I'm on the coattails of the plan here. And we can't really wait to get out there and start praying for people and uh, talking about kingdom keys, the keys to the kingdom. And one, one thing that I was sharing on social media and talking to people about is what, when we are in the will of God, you know, uh, Saxon at the Church of God, he recently talked about following the cloud, you know, the glory cloud. And when we talk about concepts like loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, and all thy strength, that means that we're going to follow the cloud. Now, when I'm talking about kingdom keys, one of the scriptures I often refer to is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his ways of doing things right, you know, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, he says, take no thought for the morrow. Because quite honestly, if we're taking thought for the morrow, that could be worry, right? But it's also, we're submitting our plans to the Lord, we're saying, God bless our plans. We're not saying, God, what is your plan for tomorrow? And he'll show you as you happen to be in his will. That's just something I've learned from reading and from experience. He shows you as you go. But another part of the revelation, if you back up a little bit, he says, um, you know, if God clothes the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow's cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Then he says in 31, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we be clothed? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Now, for years, I have pondered that it doesn't really talk about shelter. And in our Western culture, we kind of think that we, we throw our paradigm that we need a house. I mean, there's this mantra, you know, go to school, go to college, get a job, get married, settle down, and die. That's like this unspoken mantra that everybody knows. It's the model that's thrust upon us by, you know, the, the Western culture. And Jesus has a different type of plan. And I'm telling you, when you're walking in the will of God, he's going to take care of you, but it's not going to look like what you thought it looked like with our from our Western paradigm. It doesn't say anything about housing here. But as we were talking about following the glory cloud um, Sunday, you know, they had tents. They followed the glory cloud in the wilderness. I sense that a lot of us are like focusing on ourselves. 
and I noticed that uh, we like to do that. I get it. Um, this may even sound strange to you. <laughs> if if we find ourselves praying selfish prayers, like, Lord, do this for me, Lord, do that for me, and we're looking at the storms in our life, that's not the paradigm we should use. If we If we look at Scripture, we should say things like, Lord, give us our daily bread, us. We're in this battle together. We're on this boat in the storm together. As Jesus is going to the cross, he does somewhat of a selfish prayer, but then he submits, therefore, to God, and he resists the devil. Amen? He says, Lord, you know, not my will, but thy will. And a lot of us have problems. You know, a lot of us have come out of the drug culture, um, just these sins that, you know, even the Bible says there's a temporary pleasure of sin. And, And I see this as we're walking out of this sinful life. I see it's like we're coming out of the muck. We're coming out of the mire. But there's this molasses pull. It's like we're coming out of a, 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 a pool of molasses, and it's sticky. It's sticking with us as we go, and it tastes sweet. We're remembering a lot of how, how fun the sin was. But see, what we're doing is we're remembering those things that are behind us. And one of the most powerful encounters in my life is when this little lady from Columbia, she grabbed my hands and she was crying and she was speaking prophetically although I didn't I wasn't aware of that until later because I was my eyes were on my depression my eyes were on my grief you know I'd lost my father and we were very close and my eyes were just on how good things used to be I kept focusing on the past and she, as she, she held my hands and she cried, she says, Conrad, don't look back. Don't look back. Well, that was a seed that gone through the rocks in the soil of my heart. It kept revisiting me. Don't look back. In that prophetic word, this is why it's so important to follow the Spirit. When we're on the mission that God sends us, it's something that she sowed into my life, and it it was a seed that got through the rocks in my soil. It took root, and it bubbled up into a tree that I now can share with you. You know, she said, don't look back. And these scriptures... Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. In other words, I haven't arrived. You know, Paul's saying that in Philippians 3.13. But this one thing I do. Now, notice when he says one thing. He has changed his entire focus. Remember how Paul, he can lean back on how he was one of the top theologians of the day. He could say, you know, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. But he's changed himself. He's been transformed by the renewing of his mind. He says, this one thing, there's one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. People, I'm going to tell you, that means to forget your successes, forget your failures, forget your sinful life. And I I know a lot of us are, I, I, I see that a lot of us are coming out of this molasses pool of sin And it tastes sweet, and it's like the flesh wants to go back to it. I'm speaking to you today, and I'm speaking for those of you that are in depression. I'm speaking for those of you that are going through grief. As a matter of fact, I'm speaking to those of you who find yourself focusing on yourself a lot. Now, as Paul's talking about this, he says, I forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. And God has set a path before you. Okay? If you're seeking God, you take your eyes off of your storm, you take your eyes off of your poor me attitude, right? And God will speak to you on your knees. You know, if life has knocked you to your knees, you're in a very good position for prayer. 
Then he says, after I forget those things which are behind, he reaches forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. We need to think like this. And then he says, if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. This goes to the book of James. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and he upbraids not. In other words, God is going to help you through your muck. He's going to help you out of your sinful uh, molasses. I, I, I keep seeing this this uh where well, you're coming out of this water it's like you're being baptized that's what i see okay it's like a person is coming we're a new creature and that stuff leaves us and as we go towards god he cleans us up and he shows us what we need to work on amen now also another scripture that helped me and i talk about this quite a lot in my podcast for some reason i feel that the lord is leading me today is no man that puts his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. When when Lot and his family were warned by the angel to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah, we'll notice he says instructions, don't look back. This should be our focus, is to not look back. When we remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, when we assemble the body of Christ. We are reassembling the body. The the corporate group of of believers are coming together, and we're remembering the things that the Lord has done. We need to cut off that umbilical cord to sin that feeds the old man. We need to stop remembering it and intentionally focus on the new plan that God has for us. And I'm going to say it again. When we're talking about seek ye first the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God and his ways of doing things right, when we're actually walking in the will of God and we take our focus off the house, you know, that's the Western paradigm, Christianity is a mobile religion. You know, and this may poke people's bubble, but I mean, it. we're putting a lot of emphasis in our house, and we just moved into a new place, and... um you know, we have to understand that if God moves, we got to go again. You know, it's it's a portable religion. And as we're in this portable religion and our feet are actually on the path, I'm telling you, it's easier to hear from the Lord. It's easier to hear the will of God for your life. And I'm going to tell you what, as you walk it out, you're going to kind of see that it's not really the will of God for your life that you'll be focusing on, it's, Lord, what is the will of God for your body? What can I do to bear ye one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ? What can I do for you, Lord? You know, the scriptures, like I'm always talking about 2 Timothy 2, um, no man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. You know, we're in a war. Um, A lot of the scriptures talk about how we're in a war. I might talk a little bit about the uh, Ephesians 6 armor again. But our focus is not really to be on our day-to-day life affairs. And I'm going to tell you, I understand sometimes the devil throws a wrench you might have a toothache. You might have a foot ache. I mean, I get it. <laughs> I get it, but I'm hoping you're catching this prophetic football that we need to be about our Father's business. We need to do those things that He shows us to do and realize that He is Lord. Now, the very definition of Lord means He's Lord over our life. Why? Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, with your lips, basically? And not do the things that I say. If He's Lord, then we're going to be worried about We're going to be concerned about doing the things that the Lord has us to do. Now, as I'm speaking to the people that are coming out of this, I'm seeing it's a baptism, and I see that it's the water of baptism, but I also see like a a parallel um, of molasses. There's this remembrance of the old thing. It tasted sweet. Your flesh likes it. Well, you know, there's this song 
I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. Now, prophetically speaking, the joy of the Lord comes from the book of Nehemiah. And the book of Nehemiah is pr- playing a lot in our life right now. I mean, God has really been speaking to me about Nehemiah. The Bible played a couple of times twice. I'm like, whoa, this is a prophetic thing because my U version, it goes straight through. But one night when I was battling with insomnia, when I was wrestling, you know, Nehemiah played twice. I'm like, well, you know, that's something prophetic. And Nehemiah was financed from a king to come and rebuild the wall. So I'm sitting here, I'm like, going, well, here's this joy of the Lord thing in uh, Nehemiah 8.10. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So I'm starting to think about, you know, why would we trade our sorrow? You know, why would we trade our worry? Well, how about this this old man thing? Let's, let's trade the, the iniquities of the old man for the joy of the Lord. And I, and I talked earlier about how some of our iniquities need to be walked out. I'm going to readdress this scripture that I'm constantly talking about. I just talked about 2 Timothy a little bit. But 2 Timothy talks a lot about sanctification. And at the end, I'm going to talk about it again here, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will grant, give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive at him by his will. Now, I'm going to submit to you that Paul is talking to Christians who want to get their act together in Jesus, but they're struggling. They have been baptized in water. However, they have also have this this sap of molasses that's sticking with them as they're going in their new walk with Jesus, and it tastes sweet to the flesh. The Spirit has nothing to do with it. But they keep looking back, and they're struggling. And the devil uses this molasses to trick you into being, you know, captive to him, and he beats you up. He tempts you in sin, and then he beats you up for doing it. You ever notice that's how the devil works? I'm going to talk about trading here in a minute. We're going to be trading our iniquities. We're going to be trading our sorrows for the joy of the Lord, and we're going to talk about how to do that. Some of our iniquities are miraculously taken away. You know, the Lord has been bruised for our iniquities. He'll just take them. But sometimes, like in Timothy, sometimes we have to walk it out. And we need to know the truth. And when God shows you the truth, you need to become intimately familiar with that truth. And then you will be able to recover yourselves out of the snare. Notice that the snare is on the ground. The snare is on the dust, right? And he's trying to get you to go back to your flesh nature. But when you know the truth, you can recover yourself out of that snare. Jesus himself submitted himself therefore to God he resisted the devil this is in James 4 7 through 10 and the devil fled from him I've talked about this in many podcasts as we draw near to God so let's talk about this baptism we're a new creature in Christ and we're walking after the spirit but there's this molasses of sin draw nigh to God keep going towards God forget those things that are behind You know, this is a willful thing that we need to do with our mind. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to forget the past, forget the good, forget the bad, and start walking towards God, and God will draw near to us. Amen? As we walk towards God, he cleanses cleanses us. You know, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. This is a throwback to the psalm, who shall ascend uh, the hill of the Most High God, I'm paraphrasing, those with clean hands and a pure heart. Who shall see God? Those those with a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But we all start out with wicked hearts. You know, in Genesis 6, the heart of man is deceitful and wicked. Jeremiah, you know, the heart's deceitful and wicked. Who can know it? You know, but there's a point where God cleans us up. Then in this scripture here, it says something 
about being afflicted and mourning and weeping and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. When we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift us up. This is that point where we're truly sorry for our sins and and, and we're having that on our knees, the real us, the real Conrad meets the real Jesus. And I'm like, Lord, I really need help in this situation. I'm tired of tasting this molasses of the old sin. I want to walk completely 100% after the Spirit. I loathe this stuff. And guess what? He lifts us up, right? Notice how it says, turn your joy into heaviness. Well, I couldn't help but think about how uh, Daryl's song says, trade your sorrow, trade your worry, you know, trade your sickness and pain for the joy of the Lord. Well, that comes from a scripture in Isaiah, and when we're at this, when we're at this point where James says, you know, you need to to turn your joy into mourning, you need to get serious with God is what he's talking about. But check this out. This is what Isaiah talks about in Isaiah sixty one three. When we're at that point of true confession, tr- the true rending of our hearts, you know, rend our hearts and not our flesh. Let our lips be close to the Lord and our hearts too. Amen. He says in Isaiah 61, 3, to appoint to them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, the thing that hit me really strong is the garment of praise. The oil of joy in the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now notice that oil is something we have to put on. A garment is something that we have to put on. So when we're on our knees and we're in this encounter be afflicted and mourn. This is, I mean, this is where you're sorry for your sin and you're, you're fasting or whatever. And, and the things that you used to laugh about, like the sin or, or whatever, you're getting serious with God. There's this point where you become like David and he, he encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. There's a point where you're like, you know, I've repented and now I am going to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I'm going to tell you, people, when you start praising the Lord in the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of your battles, in the midst of your repentance, you know, when you feel sorry, like, man, I just, I'm really tired of this sin. I want to stop concentrating on it. I want to go with God. Praise the Lord. It's hard to think about that molasses of sin when you're praising God. Put it on. And he loves it. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. And he he will encounter you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And I'm going to tell you, he will clean you up. Just so you know, in Ephesians 6, we're always talking about the whole armor of God. Notice it. Paul tells you, tells the Ephesians, put on the whole armor of God. This is like putting on the garment of praise. It's something that we've got to do proactively. We do it. And why? So that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Remember how I said earlier in 2 Timothy, you know, there's people that are taken captive, when they're tasting that, when they're looking back at Sodom and Gomorrah, when they're tasting that little bit of molasses that's, that their flesh is leaning to, and the devil works his way in there, and you fall, well, Paul isn't going to say, he isn't going to say that the devil's never going to attack you, Christian. He says, put on the armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. 
Amen? No matter what the devil throws your way, you can stand because you have the armor of God. And lastly, I'm going kind of long here, but there's something that I wanted to to share with you. Like, where can we change our mindset to actually be victorious? Why do I want to go with God? And I, I talked about it. I talk about it all the time. Have a personal relationship with the Spirit of God. It's not just a bunch of rules. It's not a social club. It's not a clique. It's not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. And guess what happens? You're going to want to buy the entire field. You want to sell everything that you have, and you want to buy the field. And I'm going to read a scripture to you. And this is in Matthew 13, 44 through 45. I guess this would be the thrust of this podcast. In Matthew 13, 44 and 45, again, the kingdom of heaven. Notice how Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his ways of doing things right, and these things will be added unto you. You know, the kingdom of heaven. He's explaining a little bit about what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Now, when there's treasure hidden in the field, only seekers can find. You know, and I'm immediately reminded of those Geiger counters where the people are walking on the beach, you know, and they got those little things, that, and they got the earphones. They're listening intently for a sound, a sound from a different realm. The spiritual realm would apply in this, in this verse. But they're listening for a sound that they're not, their flesh is not accustomed to regularly. They need an instrument to do so. And they're searching for this, this, this uh, Geiger counter type reading to see something that's hidden in the dirt. You know, and we're made of dirt. There's something hidden there. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man's found, he hides and for joy goes and sells how much? All that he has. There's joy. And he buys the field. And he continues on, and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking good pearls, who when he found a a pearl of great price, he went and sold how much? He sold all that he had, and he bought it. Where's your relationship? Where's our relationship with God? Are we willing to be sold out? And that's where this phrase comes from. Are we willing to be sold out? Because when you realize that you will sell everything that you have, this means you're going to trade your sorrows, your shame, your pain, your iniquity, your riches, your goals, and your dreams because you found something that is of more value than all of that. You found something that when you read the Scriptures, they make sense. What will happen is when you find that, when you find that pearl of great price, when you find that treasure, treasure that's hidden in the field, and then you read the Bible, you go, oh, okay, that makes sense. But until you found it, a lot of the things that are said in the New Testament will say, I, I can't do that. So I'm going to challenge you to dig deeper and go higher. Dig in to the field. Only, only seekers find. And all that molasses iniquity that you keep looking back at, well, look forward. There is a treasure somewhere in your future, and it's going to be worth selling all you have to buy the field. God bless you. I want to thank you for being in my life. If this has touched you, please share this with your friends and family on social media. And there's also a support page at conradrocks.net. This blog and podcast is supported by people just like you. And until we meet again, dig deeper. Go buy that field. There's something there. (laughs) 
There's something there, and it's worth everything. Dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.